When the term modern philosophy is used in universities, it's usually to make a distinction from ancient and medieval philosophy. So it doesn't mean just the philosophy of our own day here in the 20th century. It means the philosophy of the last four centuries. In fact, there's one man who is generally, and I think rightly regarded, as the inaugurator of modern philosophy, the Frenchman Descartes. So in practice, what the term modern philosophy means is philosophy from Descartes onwards. René Descartes was born in France in 1596. He received an unusually good education but he also had unusual independence of mind. And while still young, he perceived that the various authorities he was studying quite often put forward arguments that were invalid. As a young man, he became a soldier and traveled widely in Europe, though without seeing any fighting. And he was struck by the fact that the world of practical life was as full of contradictions as the world of books. He became fascinated by the question whether there was any way at all in which we human beings could get to know anything for certain, and if so, how. He stopped traveling and went into seclusion in Holland, the country in which intellectual life in those days was at its freest. And there, during the 20 years from 1629 to 1649, he produced work of the profoundest originality in mathematics and philosophy, and also did a great deal of work in science. He invented the branch of mathematics known as coordinate geometry, it was his idea to measure the position of a point by its distance from two fixed lines. So every time we look at a graph, we're looking at something invented by Descartes. In fact, those two familiar lines on a graph are known by his name. They're called Cartesian coordinates, Cartesian being the adjective from the name Descartes. His most famous works of philosophy are The Discourse on the Method, which was published in 1637, and The Meditations published in 1642. He never married, though he had an illegitimate daughter who died at the age of five. He always had an eye to his own dress, was proud of being an officer, and on the whole preferred the company of men of affairs to that of scholars. But during the years of his creative work, he lived a very solitary life. When he was 54, he was prevailed on by Queen Christina of Sweden, rather against his will, to go to Stockholm and become her tutor in philosophy. It was a mistake. In the bitter Swedish winter, he succumbed to pneumonia, and he died in the following year, 1650. With me to discuss the work of this first of modern philosophers is the provost of King's College, Cambridge, Bernard Williams, author of a well-known book on Descartes. Bernard Williams, I think the best way we can begin is to try and get clear in our minds what it was that Descartes thought was the main problem he was going to have to confront when he started. Now, what was that? I think he'd been impressed by the education you referred to and his experience of the life around him with the idea that there was no certain way of acquiring knowledge. It looked as if there were some sorts of knowledge around, but there was no reliable method by which people could advance knowledge. I think it's very important that, to put it in a historical context that one realizes that science, in our sense, really didn't exist. I mean, the concept of science, in our sense, as an organized international enterprise with research methods and laboratories and all that, simply didn't exist. And there was room for an enormous range of opinions about what chances there might be of ever being on a science, uh, of there being a science. I mean, on the one hand, there were people, and perfectly sensible people, who thought that if you just found the right fundamental method, you could solve all the fundamental problems of understanding nature in a very short while. For instance, Francis Bacon, the English statesman, thought that, that you'd be able to get everything on the right road in a very brief uh, period. On the other hand, there were people, sceptical people, who thought you couldn't find any knowledge at all, that there wasn't going to be any knowledge, that it, everything was up for grabs, as it were. I think one particular reason, it's quite important, actually, why there was so much scepticism around, was actually a result of the religious reformation that after the religious reformation there were all sorts of claims made about how you found out religious truth and they all conflicted with one another and there was no way of deciding between them and that gave rise to a tremendous amount of controversy in which people said and enemies of all religions said well there simply isn't a way of solving any of these questions all these people disagree with each other you can't put it on a foundation and then religious people sort of reacting against that in turn said well, religion's no different in this from anything else. There isn't a way of putting anything on a firm foundation. So that scepticism was quite an important current 
in the intellectual climate of Descartes' time, coexisting in an odd way with very extravagant hopes of what science might be able to do and, for instance, might be able to do for mankind through what we would now call technology. For instance, there were great hopes that there could be a scientific medicine and a scientific industry and so on, but nobody quite knew how to do it. For a fundamental innovator like Descartes, the institutional setup must have presented problems too, mustn't it? I mean, almost yes. every serious institution of learning or study or teaching was in the hands of an authoritarian church whose own intellectual leaders were for the most part in thrall to ancient authority. That is, that is certainly true. Of course, there were, there were many different religious in, uh, influences, as, um, as we just said. I mean, that one effect of the Reformation had been that some seats of learning had more of a Protestant comple complexion, while obviously those in Descartes' own Paris had a Catholic uh, complexion and so on. But of course, the point you mentioned about authority is very important. Although there had been a good deal of research into what we would now call mechanics or kind of mathematical physics in the Middle Ages, and we shouldn't forget that fact, a great deal of what was, would go by the way of being science was actually in the form of commentary on ancient books, above all, though not exclusively, those of Aristotle. And one thing that Descartes and others of his generation absolutely knew was that historical authority was not the same thing as, as it were, first order research or inquiry. So in other words, what one can say is that Descartes, in starting out on his famous search for certain mm. knowledge, was really looking for a way of moving forward from the situation that you've just outlined. I mean, he was looking yeah. for a research program, as we might say in modern parlance, and prior to that, a research method. Yes, I think that, uh, that's, that's a perfectly correct description of the situation. It's very important that one further fact which conditions all of his work and which one finds the thread through it was that science was not conceived as a shared or joint or organized enterprise as it is now. For us, it's just taken for granted that science means scientists. There are a lot of people, and they communicate with each other, and there's a division of labor, there's a division of intellectual labor. At that time, in the first half of the 17th century, it was still a reasonable project for one man to have the idea that he could lay the foundations of all future science. And Descartes, who did really fundamentally believe that, it was not, as it were, a piece of megalomaniac insanity on his part, as it would be in the modern world for anybody to have that idea. Now, in my introduction to this discussion, I said that Descartes became <coughs> fascinated by the question of whether there was anything that we could know for certain. Yes. He was clear from the outset, wasn't he, that certainty and truth are not the same thing, and that the, I mean, to put it at its yes. uttermost crudity, uh, <coughs> certainty is a state of mind, truth is, relates to the way things are out there yes, yes, in sure. the world. Yeah. Uh, uh, but he seems to have thought that uh, you could only be, uh, know that you've got yeah. the truth, so to speak, if you also had grounds for certainty. So that his method was not only going to have to be one which delivered the goods in the form of worthwhile conclusions, yes. but also gave him a way of defending them against sceptical arguments. Mm. So now, how did he go about meeting that double barrel requirement. Yes. Well, Descartes had a set of conditions on inquiry, um, mm. and some of them were just sort of sensible rules about dividing questions up into handleable amounts, trying to get your ideas clear and things like that. But he had got this very characteristic and important rule for him that you shouldn't accept as true anything about which you could entertain the slightest doubt. Now, of course, as you said, on the face of it, that isn't an immediately sensible rule, because in ordinary life, we're constantly seeking true beliefs about things, but we don't necessarily want to make those beliefs as certain as possible. One thing, we'd have to invest too much effort into making the ultimate, you know, ultimately certain beliefs all the time. But Descartes, who was trying to get at the foundations of science, and also not only at the foundations of a science itself, in the sense of fundamental general truths about the world, but also to lay the foundations of inquiry, that is to be able, as he thought, to lay the foundations of the possibility of going on to find out more things, to establish that scientific knowledge was actually possible. For him, he felt that it was absolutely essential that you should start the search for truth with a search for certainty. That what he wanted to do was to be able to put the scientific enterprise, as we would put it, into a shape in which it could no longer be attacked by skeptics. So the first thing he wanted to do was to engage in a kind of, we might call it, preemptive skepticism. 
in order to put the foundations of knowledge beyond skeptical reach, he said to himself, I will do everything the skeptics can do, only better. And what I can do by pressing the skeptical inquiry hard enough is, he hoped, come out the other side with something which would be absolutely foundational and rock hard. And one of the most characteristic features of Descartes is not uh, that he confuses the idea of looking for truth and the idea of uh, looking for certainty. He saw they were two separate, separate things. But he thought that the only sure way of searching for truth was by starting for, uh, by searching for certainty. 